Good morning, afternoon, and evening, everyone, and welcome to the October 30th edition of the Ag Sector Council Seminar Series. My name is Julie McCarty, and I am a Knowledge Management Specialist with the USAID Bureau for Food Security. I'll be facilitating your webinar today and kind of just helping things move along, uh, managing the Q&A and such. So you'll be hearing from me throughout the webinar. Uh, the concept of bringing agricultural technologies to scale in the developing world has emerged as a really hot topic at USAID and beyond. And so we're delighted to bring three excellent speakers together today to discuss three aspects of scaling agricultural technologies through public-private partnerships. And we will introduce our speakers in just a moment, uh, but first I wanted to just give a few reminders uh, for the seminar today. First of all, a uh, PDF of the PowerPoint that you'll be seeing today is available in the little file downloads box that is on the left of your screen right now. Um, so you'll be able to download that PowerPoint as well as a few additional uh, suggested resources from our speakers today in that file downloads box. And that will disappear during the bulk of our presentation but will reappear during the Q&A. So if you want to wait and download those files a bit later, uh, that's fine. Also, this session is being recorded, so you will be able to access it later on the agrilinks.org website uh, and share it with your colleagues. We'll also send out an email to everyone who attended the webinar today uh, and who registered for the webinar with some post-event resources to make sure that you don't miss out on anything um, in relation to this webinar. I've noticed that a few people have shared their uh, Twitter handles in the chat box. If you're a social media person and you would like to tweet along with this webinar, please use the hashtag uh, ag events. You'll see it on your screen right there next to the Twitter icon. Uh, we encourage the, the follow along, following along on Twitter. One of our communications staff uh, will be monitoring Twitter. And we had some great engagement during the last Ag Sector Council, so we highly encourage that as well. Now, if you're an Ag Sector Council regular, you know that we usually have an in-person component to our events. Uh, but for September and October, we've been doing the Ag Sector Council as a webinar only. Now, if your favorite part of Ag Sector Council is the coffee and bagels that we provide, don't worry, we'll start back up with the in-person soon. Uh, but one of the benefits of the webinar-only aspect is the enhanced opportunity for networking. And through the webinar, we can, of course, bring together people from all over the United States and the world. And so briefly, I just wanted to highlight some of the ways that you can network at the Ag Sector Council webinar. Of course, we encourage everyone to introduce yourself, let us know where you're joining from. We also highly encourage sharing your Twitter handle, your personal or professional website, or your LinkedIn profile. This is a good opportunity to share those items. And uh, if you work for an organization that has relevance to the topic today, uh, we highly encourage sharing uh, resources from your organization or any other resources that you think would be relevant to the audience for this webinar. Also feel free to say hello to your colleagues uh, and connect with new contacts just in the general chat box. But if you'd like to do a private chat with someone uh, specific that you see on the webinar, you can find their name in the attendees box uh, up at the top right of the screen and simply hover over their name. And you'll see a little uh, start private chat indicator pop up. And that's just one way, if you'd like to, uh, that you can privately chat. And no one else will be able to see uh, what you're chatting with your, uh, your colleagues. So, we hope that you all will connect and uh, keep an active chat box during the webinar today. That'll help us out. So thank you all for sharing uh, your emails and your Twitter handles. I can see lots going on in the chat box right now. All right, well, to give an introduction to our topic and to our speakers, I would like to introduce Margaret Spears, who is the Director of the Office of Market and Partnership Innovations in the USAID Bureau for Food Security. Her office leads private sector engagement for Feed the Future, so she is a very appropriate person to give a brief intro to our topic today. And so I will go ahead and uh, pass the microphone over to Margaret Spears. So. OK. Thank you for joining today's Ag Sector Council webinar, discussing engaging the private sector in the scaling of agricultural technologies to smallholder farmers. Feed the Future, President Obama's Global Hunger and Food Security Initiative, is the United States' contribution to global efforts to significantly reduce poverty and under, undernutrition. Led by USAID, the initiative draws on the agricultural, trade, investment, development, and policy resources and expertise of 10 federal agencies. 
Feed the Future is engaging the private sector in a meaningful, comprehensive way to meet the global food security challenge through models that are integral to core business strategies. Agricultural development depends on the strength of public and private institutions working and investing together, building new markets and supply chains, sustainably taking new initiatives to scale, and improving global economic potential. Working with and through private sector markets is crucial for scaling agricultural technologies beyond any given uh, donor project to make the technology widely available and accessible to smallholders. Uh, one example of how Feed the Future catalyzes this is the Feed the Future Partnering for Innovation program, which provides grants that help commercialize proven transformational technologies to quickly and sustainably put them into the hands of smallholder farmers to improve their productivity and incomes. We are excited to have three excellent speakers joining us for today's webinar, each discussing a different aspect of scaling technologies through private sector markets. First up, Bob Rabatsky, Program Director of Feed the Future Partnering for Innovation, will present on commercialization models for scaling technology to smallholder farmers. For more than a decade, Bob has served as FinTrack's Senior Vice President. He has more than 25 years of experience designing, managing, and evaluating USAID and multilateral economic development programs in Africa, Asia, Eastern Europe, and Latin America. Next up, Mike Gavin, CEO of Porta Science Incorporated, will discuss his company's work bringing their utter check technology to dairy farmers in Rwanda through a Partnering for Innovation Technology sub Support Subaward. Mike has 30 years of experience commercializing more than 30 products, which have generated more than $500 million in revenue in both business development and product development capacity at Bayer Diagnostics, ITC, and Somerset Consulting. As Vice President of Research and Development at ITC, he was responsible for development of the first FDA-approved prothrombin time monitor for home use. Lastly, Sarah uh, Budinger will discuss findings from a recent study co-funded by USAID and the Syngenta Foundation for Sustainable Agriculture that looked at the practical issues in scaling agricultural technologies in rural markets for adoption by poor households. Sarah is a senior advisor at Syngenta Foundation an adjunct assistant professor at UC Berkeley in the Department of Agricultural and Resource Economics. Her work focuses on innovation, deployment, and adoption of technologies impacting the lives of the poor. This includes demand-driven innovation, public-private partnerships, commercialization strategies, intellectual property rights, and new product development principles applied to technologies for the poor. Thank you to all of our speakers for participating today. I will go go ahead and hand it back to Julie. Thank you so much, Margaret, uh, and thank you for introducing our speakers. So I'm going to go ahead and pass it along to each of our speakers in turn, and we encourage you to uh, post questions in the chat box throughout the presentation. Uh, if there are clarifying questions, we'll probably ask them uh, after each speaker, but we'll hold some of the larger questions until all three speakers have had a chance to present. Uh, but please feel free to enter them at any time. Uh, but we'll, we'll ask them kind of at the breaking point as we go along. And so first up is Bob Rabatsky, and uh, please go ahead and take it away, Bob. Okay, thank you. Good morning, and thank you to Julie for organizing this event, and to Margaret and Laura Chismo from USAID MPI team for inviting Partnership for Innovation to present today. Um, I first want to provide a little background, hang on, we're having trouble with the slide. Okay, there we go. I want to provide some background on our team's capacity to scale technology to smallholders. This is the space we work in. We're currently implementing five Feed the Future programs in four countries worldwide. And the model used is to promote improved technologies such as seeds, fertilizer, soil management, water and weed management, and post-harvest handling with the objective of moving subsistence farmers to the commercial sector. Results are measured in income, sales, and in improved food security. This field work has helped inform how we implement partnering for innovation. 
In September of last year, USAID initiated the Feed the Future Partnering for Innovation program to promote the commercialization of off-the-shelf technologies to smallholders. We're identifying game-changing technologies and potential commercial and mission partners to support new market entry through performance-based grants. We also want to capture, document, and disseminate effective commercialization models that can be replicated to be used by others that are entering this challenging marketplace. So as part of this learning agenda, we're capturing examples to answer, answer these questions. And because we're a learning project, we want feedback and ideas from you. So uh, we're looking forward to uh, uh, questions and comments in the, in the, in the bar um, on, the, on the screen here after this. So what is the challenge? Um, what we're trying to do is to get this farmer who is very poor, very overworked, and lacks any source of good, reliable information and technology to farm better. And, and get her to a point where she can afford better technologies. I've spoken about learning and a key lesson in getting a piece of equipment such as this or better seed or pest management technologies into her hands is not simply that the technology is better than what is currently in use, although that's, very, that's certainly very important. We've had over a century of technology development since the hoe, yet the vast majority of farmers in our target markets still use them. Why is that? The challenge is if there's not an appropriate business model used in support of a technology then the prospect of successfully launching and scaling are very low. So how do we convince her of the value of a minimum till seeder is worth the cost? Can she be assured that she makes the significant investment that adequate training and services will be available? Is there financing available for the purchase? Are there other business options to make this technology available to her, such as renting the service or leasing the equipment? Thus far, Partnering for Innovation has considered several models of commercialization. Uh, we're going to talk about four here. The distributor model, the aggregator model, the acquisition model, and the accelerator model. I'll briefly discuss the key characteristics of each as well as their advantages and challenges. I'll close by providing some examples of models used by some of our funded partners and then we'll hear more directly from uh, another company we're supporting through a grant, Porta Science. So distributorships are what we think of when we're purchasing ag equipment and supplies, as well as other goods and services. We've looked into two types of distributorships, direct and third party. Direct di distributorships are like your Apple stores. They're, they're owned and managed by the company that developed the product. In agriculture, we generally see these when selling higher-end products, such as tractor or other equipment, since customer service and support is an important part of the sale. This example here is of a South African company, Surehatch, which is slowly building a distribution network in southern and eastern Africa for its poultry egg incubator equipment. Third-party distributorships are either independent wholesalers or retailers, where volume-based sales are conducted for products such as seeds, other inputs, pest management products, and similar items. Direct distributorships have several advantages, such as better product control and pre- and post-sales service and support. And these businesses are closer to their markets and so have a much better understanding of their customers' needs. Challenges include uh, high startup costs, but generally these are paid off over time since sales margins are better. Third-party distributorships are, less, are a less costly route to get your product into an established distribution channel, but your product will be competing with other brands that are handled by the distributor. There are more intermediaries in the transaction, so your margins are going to be lower, and usually there's little in the way of post-sale support offered. A second model we call acquisition, which involves entering into a formal agreement to take partial or full ownership of a company. 
We're seeing mergers and acquisitions in the seed and ag inputs industry, for example. Uh, but this is also a strategy with privatization of state-owned enterprises. Advantages of acquisition include more immediate market access through purchasing not only plant and equipment, but also management and sales service personnel who understand the market and local legal regulatory issues and will have a much greater vested interest in protecting your intellectual property. On the downside, the upfront costs are significant, not only in capital investment, but also in management and staff time, in merging different cultures and business values before you reach full efficiency. A third model we are calling the aggregator model. This is where a nucleus farm or a consolidator will direct smallholder outgrowers to produce for a given buyer or market. It's a very common model with the export horticulture industry, with poultry production and dairy production. And it's being used more for grain production for animal feed, we've been noticing. The aggregator is meeting certain market specifications and is therefore highly motivated to promote technologies to outgrowers to improve their productivity, meet market standards, and ensure traceability. Aggregators not only offer a ready market, but also training and technical assistance and access to finance so that technology adoption rates are greater. Challenges include the increased cost and time for providing these services, ensuring compliance to market requirements, traceability is difficult and also very costly for them, and it's a huge challenge. And the aggregator also runs the risk of outgrower side selling which is also an issue that we see in the developing world. A final model to consider is the accelerator. This is a third party intermediary, either publicly or privately financed, or a public private partnership that plays a matchmaking and facilitation role between technology developers and commercial investors. Accelerators are staffed with personnel who can provide assistance with market research, technology expertise, coaching and business advisory services, and most importantly, connection to the investor community. Accelerators can speed up the technology discovery and commercialization process and provide business and legal support, especially around IP issues. On the downside, they are usually partially or wholly publicly financed, and so funding can be cyclical. And accelerators don't often operate in the developing world context. I think that this is beginning to change. Now let me give you a couple of examples um, of technology commercialization grants supported by partnering for, for innovation. These are used uh, on one or more of these business models to promote their technology. The first, Drip Tech, is marketing their Instakits, which is seen here, uh, a drip kit, a one acre drip kit in a box. They're marketing these through wholesalers and retailers that are established in the Indian market, but also they're selling their kits through an aggregator, a company called Global Green. Global Green is a food processor of gherkin and other pickle products, and in fact their products are found in the shelves of American stores uh, um, and European stores. So, um, Global Green is actually um, promoting the, the use of these uh, drip kits to 1,000 of their outgrowers. They're helping with financing and installation and also on uh, uh, technical training in the use of the, of the product so that their growers can, can uh, increase their counter-seasonal production. Um, next is uh, an example of a multi-party agreement led by World Cocoa Foundation, as well as cocoa industry partners such as Hershey's, um, uh, the ICT developer, uh, Grameen Foundation, and a global telecom giant, or Orange. The project is supporting a rollout of a smartphone-based ICT platform containing apps with production, post-harvest, and market information that lead farmers, which they're calling community knowledge workers, used to promote improved practices by smallholder cocoa farmers. Uh, these community knowledge workers will work in 120 communities um, and provide improved extension services that will impact over 5,000 families. 
And here's where you can access more information on the Feed the Future Partnering for Innovation project. Um, this is on now our newly released website. Um, so please come in and check us out there. Uh, thank you, and I'd like to turn it back over to Julie uh, for the next presenter. Uh, thank you very much, Bob. Um, before we move on to Mike, I thought I might um, ask just a question or two that came in during your presentation. Um, and uh, Richard Tinsley from Colorado, Colorado State University uh, asked, can smallholder farmers dig themselves out of poverty with just a hoe, or is some form of mechanization essential? Uh, he wanted to know just a bit more about um, you know, dietary energy balance that might restrict uh, the work day to four hours or less, kind of uh, if you wouldn't mind elaborating a bit on mechanization versus non-mechanization. Yes, thank you. Uh, that, that's a great question. Um, I would say that uh, he's absolutely spot on. That um, you know anybody who's done gardening knows that that it's very hard work, and if you're doing that not over, you know, a few square meters, but a few hundred square meters, this is really tough work. And um, for example, in Africa, uh, the the main people who end up doing this are are women, and it's backbreaking. And it's on top of um, uh, most of their other daily chores that they handle, including the kids and uh, cooking and cleaning and everything else. So, um, you know, I would say mechanization is is crucial to to uh, bringing um, bringing productivity up in the developing world. Uh, the concept that there there this will displace labor, I think, is is a false one. Um, especially during production season and harvesting season, labor is a very short commodity. And um, people's days are full, and actually um, doing this manually, is, is it actually increases the low productivity rates because generally um, people get behind schedule. They miss the early rains um, because they're waiting for people to help them in their fields to, to plow and plant. So anything we can do to mechanize and, and um, uh, speed up this process and also uh, make it uh, make it easier for people who are in the farming sector. Uh, anything we can do there, uh, we're definitely supporting. Great, thank you. Um, all right, well, I think uh, the answers to a few of the other questions have actually uh, been coming in through the chat box. Thank you so much to Liz from Feed the Future Partnering for Innovation who has been uh, answering a lot of the questions coming in. Uh, we really appreciate it. And if you have input, on uh, answering anyone else's question, um, please feel free to answer the question of another participant. The answers don't only have to come from the presenters. Um, all right, well, I think that we will go ahead and move along to Mike Gavin from Porta Science. Uh, Terrific. Um, Mike? Great, good morning, good, everybody. Mike. Um, my name is Mike Gavin, and I would like to talk about a recent Partnering for Innovation Award which utilizes a local partnership to enable the distribution of our products, as well as educational services in East Africa. First, I want to also thank USAID and FinTrack for inviting me to talk this morning. We are new to these programs and hope to see these types of private partnerships make a real impact in the region. So first, I would like to talk about uh, a little bit about Porta Science and then a short discussion on the dairy industry in Rwanda and then on to ABS, our partner in Rwanda. So first, a little background on our company, Porta Science. We were founded in 1999. Uh, we're located in Morristown, New Jersey, and have 14 full-time employees. We are an interesting mix of contract R&D and, and product company, and I'll talk about the products in just a minute. In this model, we typically have started out with uh, SBIR, NIH grants. We develop products find commercial partners that will eventually market and distribute these products. We have commercialized several products using this model, and we're currently active with several other uh, projects of this type. Uh, we've been recognized uh, for this success with the National Tibbetts Award. We um, typically, let me back up a slide, uh, we uh, typically work with uh, a number of portable uh, devices. Uh, we have been using for several years different formats. 
Uh, most of them are very portable. Most of them are amenable to very high volume uh, production. Uh, and as I've said, we work in a variety of different test formats and different media. Uh, most of them are used at point of care, and for farmers in particular, that becomes uh, very critical. So although along the way we developed our own line of products for the dairy industry, and we ended up repurposing a human diagnostic test uh, for testing milk quality, we created a separate entity called Porta Check, <clears throat> which now markets several products to help farmers improve productivity and milk quality. Uh, we, we, we utilize uh, third-party distributors to help navigate the local markets. Uh, and we've learned the importance of, sl of selecting the right uh, distribution partners uh, to ensure success. So why the dairy industry? Well, we, we ended up in the dairy industry because we saw it as a big opportunity. Uh, milk is a huge global business with nearly $200 billion in sales of uh, fresh whole milk. Price supports exist in most developed countries to help stabilize production. Some estimates suggest that the need for milk will more than quadruple by 2050, but the additional land and water needed to produce more meat and milk uh, will not. So there's a tremendous difference in milk production per cow in different regions of the world. Each cow will need to become uh, more productive to meet the need for fresh milk. Uh, we also know that routine testing and treatment will maximize production and milk quality. Routine testing enables early detection and treatment of common dairy diseases. Two leading issues for cow health are udder infections and ketosis. Ketosis is a metabolic disorder. Uh, if these are not managed properly, they can affect the health of the cow, the quality of the milk, and the productivity of the cows over their entire productive lives. Together, they cost farmers an estimated $26 billion a year just in developed countries. We sell three products currently. All use fresh milk as the sample. All use uh, disposable test formats. Our newest test, LDH, is a fast, simple, and our least expensive test. And we think it's ideal for on-farm use. And it is the test that we are utilizing for this particular project. It helps make for very rapid screening and treatment decisions. Uh, and it is uh, part of the grant is providing funds to help us scale up uh, this particular product to, make, uh, to lower the cost and to allow the product to be used in uh, less developed regions of the world. We segment the worldwide dairy market into uh, three types of farms as shown in this little graphic. And although the large dairies today produce a very significant portion of the developed country's milk, it is smaller dairies in the developing nation that will need improvement as they are in regions of very rapid growth. So for us, distributing products <clears throat> to these 65 million dairies across the globe, typically in the most rural areas, presents a real challenge. The product we intend to use in our pilot is in Rwanda. And the product <clears throat> is very simple. Uh, you can dip it into a milk sample or squirt the milk sample directly on the uh, test. <clears throat> you can compare it to a color chart. And it will, in, uh, in approximately one minute, you can detect the presence of an infection. Uh, the test utilizes lactate dehydrogenase, a known marker for infection. So the pilot program takes place in Rwanda. Uh, Rwanda is a very small country in East Africa, as probably many people here know. Uh, Rwanda is about the size of Massachusetts and has a population density about the same as Rhode Island, about uh, 1,000 people uh, per square mile. A little background on the Rwanda dairy uh, program and uh, a little bit about the dairy industry in general. Uh, about 70% of the population drinks milk, uh, but the per capita is very low, uh, is disproportionately low, in fact, compared to other countries. Uh, they have 50% of the children suffer from chronic malnutrition, resulting in 
impaired mental and physical development, anemia, higher instances of mortality. Uh, fortified milk could play a crucial role in addressing this issue. Uh, production levels average uh, about one to three liters per cow per day, which is very low. <clears throat> Most um, developed countries will see uh, production in the range of about 20 to 40 liters per day. Smallholder farms have very poor access to uh, vet services, uh, poor feed, poor animal management practices, uh, and a limited market access. <clears throat> Excuse me. Government of Rwanda has adopted a national policy of one cow per family. Um, this has had some interesting unintended consequences. Uh, as the population of animals increased, so did milk production. But the market, market access remained uh, relatively constrained due to the lack of processors. Uh, without the consistent market uptake, milk flooded the local markets, and the revenue to the farmer collapsed. Uh, this put the entire industry into a difficult financial position in many ways, defeating the one cow per family goal uh, for income generation. This is now improving. More processors are coming online. Uh, and that had a second unintended consequence, which is now that the supply to the processors is adequate. They're demanding higher quality milk from their producers. This starts the process of measuring milk quality, which is a, which is a good thing and has farmers more concerned about providing high quality milk um, in order to, um, to get payment for their, their, their products. We want to mention probably the most important part of this uh, particular program, and that's our partner in Rwanda, ABS-TCM. Uh, we have known uh, Nathaniel Makoni, uh, the founder, for several years. And without his assistance and knowledge of the region, uh, this project would be impossible. Uh, it is this project, and ABS has provided both, will provide both education and distribution of our products to the small stakeholders in this uh, particular region. ABS is headquartered in Nairobi. Uh, they provide business services for both uh, for genetics, artificial insemination. Uh, various supplies, animal feeds, and milk quality. So they do distribute our product and uh, a, a variety of products that they feel uh, help the local farmers uh, achieve higher production rates. They have uh, 33 staff members in, in four different countries. Uh, and they've implemented uh, uh, several development projects in the past. And I think they've become known to these agencies for their, uh, not only for the services that they provide, their knowledge of the region, but also their financial accountability and transparency. So one of the most important parts of this project is that they'll provide training in several locations in Rwanda. Uh, they've had a lot of experience training local farmers in various areas. Milk collection centers in particular will play a key role in the distribution of our products and the distribution of the knowledge necessary on how to use them. And you can see they have offices in Kenya, Rwanda, Uganda, and Zimbabwe. So in conclusion, we look forward to this opportunity to bring our products to this region and hope we can show that with proper tools and education, the Rwandan farmers will see an improvement to their cow's health, their milk quality, and their income will improve as well. Thank you very much. And uh, maybe we can take some questions. Thank you so much, Mike. Uh, if anyone has clarifying question, questions specifically for Mike, please feel free to type them in the chat box. Um, Mike, we did have one question from uh, Richard Tinsley from Colorado State who asked, when animal rearing practices are poor in smallholder communities, is it usually because of limited knowledge, limited labor, or other operational problems? Um, I think it's probably limited knowledge, um, as well as access to uh, some of the tools uh, required uh, to improve the, uh, the cow's health, especially around uh, the period of uh, fresh cows and the birthing process. Um, Without the proper tools and uh, without proper uh, feed additives and um, uh, 
diagnostic products. It's difficult, for instance, to diagnose, for instance, a cow that would uh, could fall into ketosis. They're very susceptible to ketosis after giving birth. So without that knowledge of the fact that they may have to change their feed um, in order to prevent this and reduce this occurrence, um, uh, they can run into some real problems. So it's really a kind of a combination of things, but I think education is, is crucial. Uh, great, thank you. And uh, Milton Lohr from the Kenya Feed the Future Innovation Engine in Nairobi asked, do you anticipate that there could be opportunities in the near future for licensing of port science or port check technologies towards diagnostic manufacture in Africa? Yes, that's actually a great question. Um, I like that question because I think for our products to be uh, at the lowest uh, price point possible in order to have the greatest uh, use in countries like um, Africa, that a local uh, licensing and manufacturing is, is anticipated. Uh, that would be the second phase of what we would like to do is be able to provide the tools locally uh, in some of these countries regionally to be able to manufacture the products and distribute the products, uh, it would get the products to the farmers at the lowest possible price point. So we do anticipate that and actually look forward to being able to do that uh, in the not too distant future. Uh, great, thank you. And let's see, one more question that came in specifically for you. Uh, was from J.W. Camillion from the USAID Senegal office, um, who asks or says, the, the ABS device seems very simple to use. I wonder how could transhuman communities in pastoralism zones in the Sahel and in the Horn of Africa uh, could access sec such a technology, um, given the nature of transhuman? Uh, I'm not sure I follow the transhuman portion, but I think that uh, <clears throat> our distribution model will utilize regional uh, third-party distributors in, in every part of the world where we find some demand. Uh, currently, for instance, ABS is providing that service for us in Africa. We have other distributors in other regions of Africa uh, that provide access to our products. I'm not sure that that completely answers the question, but uh, if, if someone wants to approach me on the side, I'd be happy to go into more detail. Uh, great. And let's see, one more question came in uh, from Jim Yasmin from the USAID uh, Bureau for Food Security. Let me see if I can come up to it. Um, all right. He asks, in many ways, the problem in Rwanda is not a lack of milk, but a lack of milk quality standards. The new test strips are a great new technology, but their effectiveness is compromised by lack of clear signals from the market back to producers that substandard milk will not be accepted. What strategies do you and Nathaniel have to go, uh, go to that the next step of having SCCs being a screening measure at MCC level? Well, that's a great question. I think that um, in the early phases, and I think I talked a little bit about it in terms of the unintended consequences, uh, there was a time in Rwanda where uh, there was a lack of milk uh, in local uh, and in distribution networks throughout the country. Uh, the one cow per family uh, program helped change that and relatively dramatically increase the milk production to the point that it, uh, it couldn't be handled by the processors, um, forcing the, the milk prices to collapse. The second unintended consequence of that was that, uh, in fact, the processors then became picky about what milk they were going to buy from the local farmers. And so the first screening element went into place where they did have and have begun to use the somatic cell count, the SCC, which is probably the most common uh, measure of milk quality worldwide, as a screening tool to determine which uh, milk they would utilize in their at their processing plants. So this was the the first step was to make sure that there was enough milk supply. And the second step was okay. Now that we have a supply, now we can utilize quality indicators to make sure that the quality of the milk is improving. And then that feeds back to the farmers, and they recognize that now there's a need for not only producing milk but also to track and measure 
the quality of the milk. Otherwise, they may not uh, be paid for their milk. Um, and as the model has developed in other parts of the world, uh, there is uh, payments and bonus payments that are paid to uh, farmers based on the level of quality of the milk. It's common in most developed countries to have a bonus payment system that the lower they keep their somatic cell count, the higher their payment is for milk. So we begin to see the very, very early uh, stages of this system being implemented in countries like Rwanda. I think there's a number of natural stages that these countries need to go through before they reach that stage where they're going to have a consistent level of quality and that quality is demanded by the processors and knowingly supplied by the farmers, the local farmers. So I think we see the beginning of that, but um, many of these countries have a long way to go. Great. Well, thank you so much, Mike. Um, I think we'll go ahead and move along to uh, Sarah now. Uh, Mike, if you wouldn't mind um, just taking a glance at some of the comments that came in the chat box while you were speaking. Um, and maybe there's a chance to, uh, to respond to some of the additional comments uh, in the chat. But we will go ahead and move along to, um, thank you, Mike, to Sarah Bodiger from Syngenta Foundation from Sustainable Agriculture and UC Berkeley. So Sarah, please go ahead and Thanks. take it away. Thanks. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about this project, Planning for Scale, that I've been leading. Syngenta Foundation and USAID have funded a great team of consultants that have been working on scaling in seed systems in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, but the, the project was really designed to look um, at scaling issues across a number of different agricultural technologies, so it should provide a broader interest. Uh, to uh, to a, a lot of different sides and, and a lot of different people in, in this webinar. It's also designed to try to speak to the more practical side of scaling. Uh, scale is such a buzzword in international development, but uh, when you come down to asking questions about how we get better at catalyzing scale, how we should be funding in this space, how we should be designing programs to scale, um, it's pretty hard to find things uh, on that sort of practical, practical level. So this is designed uh, to at least try to hit uh, some of the more practical sides. It's got a lot of moving parts to it, the project. We started, as I start most of my products, uh, projects by getting uh, onto Skype and spending long hours talking to really smart people around the world. Uh, we did a lot of interviews and came up with a document called Crowdsourced Lessons for uh, scaling seed systems that should be downloadable from this site here. And it's got some, some fantastic practical advice uh, from around the world. We also came up in those interviews with a lot of stories, um, really uh, stories that have great lessons. Um, some successes, uh, a lot of failures, <laughs> unfortunately, about where uh, we, we, we should have scaled or we tried to and didn't. So we started writing those up. There's uh, seven vignettes currently online at this Ag Partner Exchange website. And there's more in the pipeline. We've got a great one coming up on fake seed, um, sort of looking uh, more broadly also at the, the issues of, of counterfeit products and brand equity in, in rural markets, which are very have a really big impact on, on scaling. But the real meat of the project is in uh, a set of briefs. There are nine briefs. You can see some of the topics here on this slide. Um, these are a, a deeper dive into some really key issues in how to scale. Now, this uh, uh, convening is about public-private partnerships, so I'm going to um, uh, drill down into that particular area. Um, and, and leave you to, to read the briefs as they come out. They should be out, um, these ones should be out in early December and also posted on the Ag Partner Exchange website. But before I get into uh, some, some particular lessons in public-private partnerships and scaling agricultural technologies, I need to go to one sort of foundational piece of our work, which was our definition of scale. Um, because it's a little different from uh, from some of the way that, that scale has been approached in the past. Now, there's two fundamental components. Um, the first is uh, that uh, our definition is, is that successful scale has to be driven by really understanding the farmer's decision-making. 
So it has to start by understanding, you know, what is the farmer thinking about when they're deciding whether to use your technology? What are the risks that they're facing? What other technologies are available? What, what's that farmer's return on investment to adopting this technology? And all of those, uh, those, those answers to those questions really drive the whole process um, way back up into even the, the research and development stage and, and in seed, the plant breeding stage. Um, seems uh, like uh, a sensible, uh, sensible idea to have uh, the market and the customer driving scale, but we have not done this historically so much in international development. We often have sort of panels of experts making decisions and, and not enough feedback from the ground up. Uh, a good example might be in, in seeds that uh, we, we naturally and, and uh, appropriately focus a lot on yield as a trait. But if you focus on yield to the exclusion of other traits like taste, uh, color even, texture, cooking time, processing characteristics, you're going to end up with a seed that, that really isn't uh, going to be adopted and, and isn't going to go to scale. So, so our approach is very much uh, to, to focus from the farmer up um, and, and that that's the way that, that successful scaling is going to happen. The second component of our definition is that we need to strive for sustainability over time in scale. We all know uh, examples of technologies that have been successful in scaling, but when that grant disappears or when that subsidy uh, disappears, the use of the technology drops precipitously. So uh, again, a, a fairly um, sensible way to approach scale, but, but also one that we really haven't paid enough attention to in terms of trying to, to catalyze uh, impacts that, that will be long-lasting after our investments have, have finished. So these uh, two pieces make it uh, demand-driven scale. Another buzzword. <laughs> I, I seem to have spent the entire year defining buzzwords in international development. Uh, I, this was a, another uh, a team, great team of consultants for the World Bank. Uh, I see that uh, Catapult Innovation is, is online here and they partnered with us to try to define what demand driven means in terms of commercializing technologies in international development and that that work is on a, a website called demanddriven.org but you can see from this definition that that the private sector is really critical in our if you define scale the way we're defining it in this in, in the work that we're doing, you, you can't achieve scale without the private sector. And you, you need the private sector all across the spectrum um, in, in a lot of, of diverse parts. Information and communication technologies are, are a key piece. These are some of the technologies that you can invest in that will have a sort of a, a big catalytic change. We, we've been using mobile phones for a while in international development, mostly to push out information to farmers. And the next uh, generation of this, I think, is going to be, and it's already started, pulling back in information to understand market intelligence, to understand adoption decisions. When you uh, couple what's going on in, in mobile phones with some really interesting advances in remote sensing, in wireless sensors, uh, we're really getting towards the point where these ideas of demand-driven scale can, can really be supported. But we need the private sector in there. Um, we also need the private sector for uh, diagnostics. The uh, presentation before is a great example. This is uh, a very low-tech uh, moisture meter uh, for maize. <laughs> you uh, put the salt and the maize in, in a bottle, shake it up, and, and the salt absorbs the moisture and, and sticks to the side of the glass. But it turns out that the diagnostics tools in, um, in uh, livestock, in seed, in, um, uh, in a lot of different areas, in soil are, are really critical and we need the private sector there. We also, of course, need the private sector for sustainable manufacturing, sustainable supply channels over time. We need uh, great access to R&D capacity that comes from public-private partnerships, intellectual property rights, know-how. All of these things are, are places where uh, we can think of public-private <laughs> partnerships that exist, uh, and we need uh, a lot more of them. Connecting farmers to markets, uh, a, a very critical piece. This is a, a picture of cassava flour. Uh, many of you will know the SAB Miller public-private partnership 
that uh, created a mobile processing unit for cassava, which has addressed one of the, the most frustrating pieces of the cassava value chain that's been a constraint to really connecting farmers to markets. Uh, Bueller, the uh, global um, processing equipment manufacturer, has just made a mobile maize mill. And it's uh, kind of one of the areas that I've been watching is what happens if we were to decentralize some of the processing. Uh, again, private sector is um, really important for, for connecting farmers to markets. So given that, that, that you, you know, had a, a very um, fast tour, uh, and I, I think most of the people online here recognize the importance of, of the private sector, in, in these different areas, it, it remains true that we really don't do the best job uh, in the public sector. And I use we coming from a university background and a, and a foundation background, so very much from the public sector side, we could be doing a lot better. So I'm going to close the, the presentation with four areas. There are many, but I, I've uh, kept it to four areas where I think we could really prioritize some, uh, some work in, in getting us to understand how to partner better in public-private partnerships. And the first is uh, we really need to build some institutional capacity in brokering public-private partnerships. These are not easy uh, to broker. They're, it's hard to understand where the opportunities are. This, these kinds of, of uh, capacity doesn't really exist in companies. It, it's being built some, in some uh, public sector institutions. The CJR centers, for instance, have, have started really building their capacity to do this. Um, but, uh, but that's not necessarily the most efficient way to do it. I think there's uh, a real need to figure out what should be commonly shared in terms of these functions. Our work uh, has identified five functions that need to be performed in order to, um, to really get better at brokering public-private partnerships. The second area uh, that I'd like to talk about is, is metrics. In the public sector, we really need to up our game uh, on metrics in public-private partnerships. This is always a, a contentious piece, always something that needs to be negotiated in a partnership. Um, private sector manages and, and collects data uh, very differently than the public sector. And, and those pieces uh, do get worked out in partnership deals. But in the process, we we're, we're actually have a lot to learn from the private sector. The private sector um, uses metrics to manage operations. They use them in a much more real-time way than we do. Uh, they don't wait several years afterwards and look back and decide whether or not uh, we were successful. So in addition to the, to the really important impact measurements that we do in the public sector, we, uh, we have a long way to go in, uh, in, in starting to make use of more real-time metrics to improve how we do things. The second way, uh, just uh, to highlight some of the, the work that needs to be done on metrics, is to look at this, uh, this question of cost effectiveness. In the private sector, uh, of course, uh, you're, you're only going to uh, pay for information as long as it's, as it's of value to you. Uh, but we don't tend to take that perspective in the public sector. So a, a much more careful look at how much it costs us to collect this information. And, uh, and where, where the really valuable pieces are uh, to, to get that uh, onto the agenda. The, the third of, of four areas that I think we need to work on is understanding the role of private capital. So in the public-private partnerships that we usually think of, the, the, the company that's involved is often giving in-kind. Uh, and, and a lot of the partnerships that we think of, uh, there isn't necessarily a, a, a cash financing piece. Um, but there's a whole other sector of the private uh, the, uh, of, of uh, the private sector that's involved in, in financing partnerships, enterprises, um, programs that have a real impact in the markets that, that we are concerned with. The flow of private capital is, of course, really important to, to scaling issues, and I think we miss out on understanding what's going on in private equity. Private equity is sort of exploding in sub-Saharan Africa. In impact investing, in corporate social responsibility, there's some really big changes happening. And sort of integrating that kind of risks and returns framework from uh, the private capital uh, world and, and the decision making that goes on there is really going to be important for, um, for creating scaling strategies. 
And the last one I'll focus on uh, before I end is uh, that we we also need to recognize the limitations of the private sector. There's uh, in some of the work that I do, there's this sort of mythology that if you create a good technology in the public sector, you'll somehow have a be able to hand it off, and the private sector will scale it. Um, the reality is that that that's uh, that, that doesn't happen in, in quite a simple way. Of course, the reality is a lot more complex than we'd like to think. Um, in, in seed, if you think about the most advanced seed systems in the world, uh, the, the role of the public sector has changed over time, but it's still critical. It's still there. Uh, and in seed, there will always be crops, varieties, populations that are just not served by the private sector. And this is true in, in most technologies. If you look at uh, the sort of holy grail of, of scale, the, the cell phone, the mobile phone, uh, which has scaled faster than, than anyone can imagine, we're still at this point where the numbers just don't make sense for companies to put up cell phone towers in, uh, in really rural places. So uh, the, the cost of building and running the towers means that there's a constraint to how far those networks go. And that's what we're, as a, as a public sector, you know, that's the role now is to try to get the, these networks uh, further out to the people that, that need coverage. So the one piece in all this sort of moving target of how the public sector's role changes as things scale, I think the one piece that doesn't change is our responsibility for stewardship. It's really, you know, we're the ones uh, that have to keep asking the questions, have to keep Try, driving for the social and environmental impacts, and really um, keep uh, trying to figure out whether smallholder farmers are getting the technology that they need to feed their families and to uh, bring themselves out of poverty. So that's a very fast uh, whirlwind tour through some of what's on my desk right now, and uh, happy to, to answer questions. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Sarah. Uh, we had a couple of clarifying questions that came in. Uh, Florence Reed from Sustainable Harvest International asked, how does Syngenta, Syngenta Foundation define sustainable agriculture? And uh, Sophia Vanderbilt from uh, the USAID Bureau for Food Security asked if you can provide examples of the real-time metrics that you mentioned. Uh. <laughs> um. So, uh, in in terms of the real time metrics question, uh, this is you know sort of understanding from a from if you're a program director, um, are you are you um, implementing your program in the most effective way possible? So these are not um, you know what the what the outcomes of your program are, but they're really whether or not you could be reaching more people in a different way, whether you're doing things in in uh, putting the incentives in the right place for your staff. Um, so they're they're sort of the basic metrics of uh, that that businesses use to understand uh, whether they could be uh, doing better. Um, in terms of uh, sustainable agriculture in in the Syngenta Foundation, you know, I think we all recognize that uh, that the constraints globally mean that we have to feed more people on less land uh, and with uh, a lower impact on the environment. So it's it's that nexus that, that we're all coping with, uh, trying to figure out um, how how to do that. Um, I think Syngenta Foundation does believe uh, that, uh, and certainly in, in my work, that technology plays a big role in that, uh, in allowing us to be able to uh, to do that. Thank you. Uh, we also had a question from Kitty Cardwell with the National Institute of Food and Agriculture at USDA in DC. Uh, she asks, how do we put commercial value on knowledge products? A great deal of ag development research results in systems understanding. However, the public sector doesn't always have the ability to scale knowledge, lacking a commercial or private sector interest. How does Syngenta deal with knowledge products? <laughs> That's a great question. and I think. It's actually a, um, a piece that, that I need to address in the next round of my work, that, that a lot of my work focuses on uh, products and services. But, but the reality is that the products and services, uh, and, and this was one of the comments in a, from a reviewer for our work, 
you need the knowledge to go along with it. The, the value of those products really isn't there unless the knowledge is there. And and commercializing knowledge is is a really uh, difficult. It's a whole other uh, it's a whole other activity. And and there is a much bigger role for the public sector. It's 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 someplace where we've tried. You know, we've seen in from market information systems and trying to get, um, for instance, price uh, data to farmers, uh, weather data to farmers. It's really hard to commercialize uh, information and knowledge. Uh, so I think that's a that's a, a hard one. Um, that uh, there are a, a lot of models out there, but uh, personally, I think there's a it's a it's one of the areas where there's just a much bigger role for for the public sector to remain involved. Uh, thank you, Sarah. And Bob actually wanted to jump in and provide a, another answer to Kitty's question. So, Bob, please feel free to do so. Um, and Bob, just make sure that you unmute your microphone before speaking. Okay, is it working now? <laughs> yes. Hello? Uh, okay. Um, yeah, it's, uh, knowledge yes. knowledge dissemination is really a, a big issue um, in the countries where we work. And I, I agree with Julie. You know, more public sector investment in that is critical. Um, also, in the dissemination of, uh, of knowledge, such as market information or uh, production information or uh, you know any any kind of ag based information, I think that those can be embedded services that are provided to enhance the um, competitiveness of, of a private company for for instance if you 're a um, you 're a consolidator um, or a, a transporter, you know the infamous coyotes uh, uh, middlemen. If you're providing more market information or more product quality information back to the to the farm level, then you know you're you're giving the farmers um, more value for for the services you're providing. So th that's another approach that we can look at certainly. Great, thank you, Bob, and. Uh, at this point, I think we can go ahead and take additional questions for all three of our speakers. Uh, if anyone has questions, please feel free to enter them into the chat box. We've been tracking all the questions that have been coming in. And um, if we happen to have missed your question um, and you really want it answered, please feel free to enter it in again. Uh, we'll also make sure to kind of comb through for all the resources that have been shared or for all the requests from resources from the presenters and uh, make sure that we collect those resources and send them out along with the uh, post-event email that we'll send out. So if, if there's something you, uh, you're you looking for, we'll do our best to comb through and address it. Um, one question that came in from Eric Fernhaber from the USAID EAT project at FinTrack um, that was entered during uh, Sarah's presentation, but each presenter might have an answer. Um, was uh, in relation to the point that Sarah made about ICT typically only being used for pushing info, do you have any examples of projects or strategies that are effective at pulling info back from farmers in the private sector using ICT, thus creating feedback loops? Um, Sarah, I didn't know if you had an answer to that question or if anyone else did. I'm happy to, and uh, this is actually uh, something that we've written about in, in the work that's coming out in mid-December. Um, we are beginning to use increasing uh, surveys with smallholder farmers uh, to, uh, to, to, to um, understand uh, better uh, what their adoption decisions are. Um, we're not there yet. Uh, Syngenta Foundation is working on uh, a a verification of adoption, uh, which, which is a um, right now the model is uh, very uh, close to uh, the Sproxo model. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but it's uh, where you uh, there's a in the packaging there's a scratch card, and, and as a um, as a farmer uh, might be on a bag of seed, you type in uh, the code um, and SMS it to a free number. Uh, and and it's a it's a verification that you've adopted uh, this particular technology. We don't have that right now. Uh, you know, when we put technologies out there, we, we have very little idea where they end up. Um, so so that's another example of how we could begin to uh, get that that market information back up. There's also some interesting advances in uh, geolocation, sort of understanding as. Uh, 
feature phones in in rural parts of the world start to get uh, cheap enough to have um, and and applications that have GPS connected to them. I think there's a lot of possibility uh, for for really beginning to understand and interface back with the the market and the customers. Uh, thank you, Sarah. Um, Bob, or my hi, hi, this would you is like Bob. To yeah, um, that's a great question, and actually, we've been talking to Sarah about efficient ways to do this because obviously, tracking, tracking technology adoption, and um, seeing how how these things are scaling up, especially after our grant is over, is is something that's uh, we're very interested in trying to do. Um, the the second case I, I provided on uh, World Cocoa Foundation actually that's a wonderful platform uh, where these community knowledge workers who are out in the, out in the villages out in their communities um, can actually provide um, information responses to survey questions fairly inexpensively. You can shoot them out a couple of questions about okay how many of the farmers that you've trained ha have um, have begun to uh, weed, let's say, weed their um, their cocoa patch, or something along those lines, and they can go out and check and feed feed that information back. So you can track track uh, technology adoption. And I was very interested in in reading about over the weekend um, the the USAID mission in uh, in Afghanistan, and they're struggling with tracking the impact of their programs as the U.S. military pulls out. And uh, just uh, as Sarah was mentioning, a lot of the, crowdsourcing ideas are being explored there. So that may be a place we want to keep our eye on for, for low-cost uh, pull ICT um, um, information. Excellent. Thank you. Um, Sarah, Laura Sismo from the Bureau for Food Security asked, can you elaborate on your previous comment on the evolving role of the public sector in technology scaling? and how the private sector can best engage in scaling technologies in relation to public sector efforts. Sure. Um, so I think there's a, the, the, the first part in, the, in that interface is to really identify that the areas where the private sector may have, um, uh, may have opportunities. And there are uh, you know, the need for uh, accessing markets. There's... Um, uh, reputational issues. There's a whole bunch of incentives as to why private sector gets involved. Um, a huge one, actually, right now in the larger companies that I work with is uh, because it, it improves their ability to retain staff when they are engaged uh, in these kinds of, of programs. Um, but but there's a lot more in terms of accessing markets, in terms of building their, their brand equity out there, uh, so that when um, the populations that, that we work with uh, do end up coming up and, and, and the, the companies uh, look at their new levels of income and, and they recognize the, the brand that's there. So there's a lot of reasons which is sort of understanding why the private sector might engage. Then the public sector can uh, really tailor um, some of those pieces to encourage that. There's often a, a bridge uh, that needs building there. It might be just in the information. It, uh, it's not common in, in a lot of companies to really think about outside this box to, to understand these issues. So it, it may be just presenting it in, in, a, in a particular way to a company. It may be in reducing some of the risks around it, which are too high for a company. Uh, but there's a, uh, there's a, a, a catalyst there. Um, some of the partnerships that I work on, the, the public-private partnerships, um, there's a there's a revenue piece that the, the company you know wants to invest can see uh, that the sort of longer term is a is a good investment but they need um, they need that initial um, piece to that that's maybe provided by a foundation to to get over that hurdle so so I think there's that's one role for for the public sector um, there's also you know the knowledge role we talked about there's also um, you know, particular markets that we know uh, really won't be served by the private sector. So there are uh, there there are uh, the reason it's a moving target is because it, you know you just don't know how the markets are are going to unfold. Um, we could have said you know, five years ago that that cassava uh, wouldn't be a commercial crop in in sub-Saharan Africa and that it would remain a, a food security crop for smallholder farmers, but that's uh, p potentially changing now. Um, so I think it's the, the job of the public sector to keep an eye on that uh, that moving target and to keep figuring out where they can draw in more 
private sector activity and where that private sector activity probably isn't going to go. Um, and, and so therefore, where they need these sort of longer term investments. Great, thank you. And, and Bob, you have a comment? Um, yes, thank you. Uh, that's a great question, Laura. Um, I, I think uh, one thing we've, we've been learning is that um, the public sector really has to make, make um, the IP, the ownership of the technology available to the private sector in order for the private sector to commit to, to the investment to scale it up. And uh, we're seeing this in several examples uh, through these, through these, um, uh, these, these centers um, that we've been supporting and that USDA is supporting. Um, so that, that's one key issue there. Thank you, Bob. Uh, we'll continue to take a few more questions, but I also wanted to let you know for anyone who is uh, looking to jump off the webinar that we do have a uh, survey that we'd love for you to complete to help us improve uh, future Ag Sector Councils. And uh, right now I'll go ahead and put the short link to the survey in the chat box. Um, so if you need to take off, we'd appreciate if, uh, if you would take that survey. All right, and so looking at a few of the other questions that have come in, uh, we had a question from Ron Korthak from Water Stewardship, who would like to know uh, if you know of any projects that are simultaneously looking at the scalability of water quality protection practices uh, while impacting yield and food security, just if anyone knew of those. And, and perhaps you don't, and if anyone, um, anyone participating in the webinar has answers for that question, please feel free to enter them in. Um, so. Yeah, nothing comes to mind here. Although right. water, water quality um, is, is, is critical, um, for sure. Yeah, I second that. There's <clears throat> it's critical for in the dairy industry for sanitation purposes, and it's one of the large problems to overcome in trying to keep cows clean uh, with with water with with good clean water sources not being available everywhere um, we also had a, a question that I'm not surprised was asked earlier in uh, in the presentations about the definition of scale and scaling um, and I wasn't sure if if any one of you wanted to provide uh, a general answer to the definition or what resources you would suggest as uh, the best resources for getting a handle on the issue of scale. That's a very difficult question. Um, uh, differs. <laughs> let's see. Uh, let's see. Ahead, Bob, why don't you go ahead first? Or, yeah, or Mike. Okay. okay. Call on Mike first. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> It's a very difficult question because I think it um, varies based on technology uh, to a large extent or the product type in particular, what the, the scale is in absolute numbers. So I think it's a very difficult uh, question to ask. I think uh, in terms of some of our areas of expertise, we're always talking about the word scale and scaling and um, in some products, uh, scaling means you need to get over 10, 15, 20 million units per year. In other products, it may mean a 1,000 units per year to hit scale. Um, and then scale on a, on a public-private partnership basis could mean totally different things. So I'm not, I'm not sure uh, how to even answer that question. Bob may have a better suggestion. No, I mean, I, I, that's, that's a great answer and a commercial answer, which, uh, you know, is, is I think something that we need to keep in mind. Um, you know, we have, to, we have to do our work un under the assumption that we eventually will not be needed any longer and that, uh, you know, either the established uh, private sector in a country or the private and the public sector in a country can, can take and run with these, these technologies. And so, um, yeah, the scaling question, I think, is can we hand off and can it uh, successfully continue itself uh, uh, w without, uh, without our assistance? Uh, thank you both for your answers. And we had a question come in from Jeannie Harvey 
from BFF, who has a question about Sarah's suggestion to focus from the farmer up. It seems that often due to funding, timing, and other factors, this necessary step gets skipped. Can folks talk a little bit about how you are ensuring that the step does not get missed, and in fact, farmers' voices are involved in design and suggestions or paths for scaling? Sarah, well, I did have one. Oh, yeah, I all, mean, all three. <laughs> <laughs> we'll let Sarah um, take it away first. <laughs> this is where I stand up on my soapbox and, and say, uh, absolutely, Jeannie, we, we need to uh, we need to do this, and um, and it doesn't happen enough. Um, part of it is a cost issue for sure, uh, but but that means that we need to invest in. And cheaper ways to do it. We 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 can get information back up the chain from uh, farmers in uh, not as expensive ways, uh, but we need to figure out how to do that, and we need to make those uh, those methods available. But the other piece is really in the incentive structure of uh, the organizations that are further up the chain, um, and those uh, those don't respond to uh, to markets. They're not built that way in the public sector. They're built uh, to have uh, different incentive structures. So I think there's a lot of work to be done. Um, and, and ultimately, to, to me, that's the, the critical piece in whether you're going to be successful in scaling, is whether you, you really uh, can turn your, your ear and turn your, the innovation process and the scaling process to, to look towards the market and have it inform what you're doing. Uh, I have a comment. I think. In this, in our particular grant, uh, it was important to get the voice of the farmer into how we were going to um, not only provide educational services, but where they're going to be provided. <clears throat> and then for the product, how we would package the product that would make sense in the local economy, in the local use. So uh, we, we asked our partner, uh, ABS in this case, to uh, do a preliminary survey. And a little further along in this particular process, they're going to do a more formal survey to try to get that information from the farmers to make sure that we are providing the services that they need um, and understand uh, in formats and in locations um, that are applicable to their needs. So I think it's a very, it's, it's a very good question. It's a very uh, important process, I think, for uh, all commercial companies to uh, to, to get the voice of the customer into the process, and I think this is just another mechanism to do just that. So uh, we've uh, allowed some funds to be used uh, for surveys uh, to try to get to that. Thank you, Mike. Hi, hi this, Bob. Did you have a comment too? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is this is this is a great question, and obviously the the most important question in in scaling any any type of technology. Um, it, it is, uh, as Sarah said, uh, you know, expensive and difficult, but I think it's doable. And, and with, with the use of, of newer technologies, I mean, uh, this marketplace is more accessible. But it, it's really something that um, the technology developers or commercial companies, um, the, re the reason they're not in these markets is they, they don't understand them and they don't see them as profitable. And so um, getting information back to them that, that um, that informs them on that is important, um, and and for us, we're we're looking for um, projects that really have a good on the ground uh, connection. Um, we we understand that uh, the maybe the commercial company with the technology won't have that, but they need to be partnered up with with someone who does and who can provide farmers with um, with good training. Um, with with demonstrations, uh, I mean basically blatant marketing, but it, uh, demonstrations are marketing, and 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 support, um, and something that I think we all need to look at is um, what's the repurchase rate for for a technology or an idea? Uh, you know, if you go through and you promote it and they purchase it once, that's fine, but are they coming back and buying it and wanting more of it because it works so well? That's that's a key thing to to look at. Great. Thank you all for providing such helpful answers to these questions uh, and for also um, so deftly uh, working from three different locations to jump in um, for the answers can to I these just, questions. Can I pick, pick okay. up on Bob's last comment? Um, so, so I think this, this idea of um, 
repeat custom is is a super important metric. Uh, you know, if if a if a, a farmer comes back to buy an input, for instance, the next season, it's you know it's an implicit demonstration that that input was worth it to them, um, and and is a really sound endorsement of the value that that we don't usually have. Um, but that repeat custom metric, which is you know ideally in in particular technologies, what you'd base sort of scaling success on. Unfortunately, it, it just doesn't exist for a lot of technologies. If you're uh, trying to um, scale up drip irrigation, for instance, uh, there, the, the repeat custom isn't there in the same way. Uh, so you need to you need to try to figure out how to approximate that. Um, it might be in, uh, in in continued maintenance to understand. Well, you know, a lot of drip systems uh, fail to be continue to be used because of the maintenance issues. So if people are still engaged in maintenance. It means that the drip system has had value and they really want to keep using it. Um, but uh, for technologies like open pollinated uh, varieties of crops, we can't use that repeat custom um, metric uh, to, to look at, at scale. But I do think it's an important one uh, to think about. Uh, fantastic, thank you. Well, we only have about uh, three or four minutes left and so I wasn't sure if any of the speakers had a, a final comment that they wanted to make or a final question they wanted to ask of either all of the participants or of um, the other speakers. And so, uh, Bob, I don't know if you'd like to start off with any closing comments. Um, uh, well, thank you again for giving us the opportunity. As I said, uh, you know, we're learning um, and we're, we want to take a look at the, the different um, commercialization models that, that we we see out there um, and that people are using and see where they're where they're applicable and practical and also I mean we were able to kind of design in place, places where uh, projects like this one and other donor supported projects can intervene to to kind of uh, to um, boost boost those uh, models and and support them so that they can um, in the end get sustained and, and established in a country. So, so that's certainly something we're looking at. Thank you. Uh, Mike, do you have any closing comments? Well, I just wanted to thank everybody for giving us the opportunity to, to speak to everyone today and uh, FinTrack and USAID in particular for uh, sponsoring this particular grant. Uh, we look forward to um, uh, being able to provide some feedback as we move through the process. And I think FinTrack has done a great job in helping us identify some of the metrics that were talked about here today in providing, uh, trying to get the, uh, the attention of the farmer and get their uh, voice into uh, this process, um, getting uh, women into this process, um, and pro providing metrics also for success in which we're looking for re repeat business. We're looking for uh, those farmers to come back and utilize the products in, uh, in through several cycles and to uh, measure that as part of our, uh, the overall performance. So we thank them <clears throat> for their insight and their help in trying to put this, uh, this grant together. So thanks. Thank you, Mike. Uh, lastly, Sarah, is there anything uh, you'd like to say to wrap up? Sure. Um, just the, the 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 questions have been great, and and this sort of theme that um, uh, the the person who said you know what what is scale, <laughs> um, and and if you look at at scale as a buzzword, and you look at uh, demand driven as a buzzword, um, this is a, a a larger conversation that we need all the input we can get on uh, to really start translating these concepts that we've been talking about for a long time. Um, that are so important uh, in in uh, benefiting smallholder farmers to translate them into some practical pieces. Uh, so so I look forward to a lot of feedback from from everybody that's that's out there on this webinar and and really hearing uh, more insight on both of those topics. Thank you, Sarah. We completely agree that this is part of a, a much larger conversation and that the the definitions of these key terms are evolving and. Um, an important piece of our work going forward. And uh, on that note, we are actually going to continue with the scaling topic for the November 20th Ag Sector Council seminar. Uh, 
and our presenters will be from the Modernizing Extension and Advisory Services Project uh, funded by USAID. So we'll be looking at scaling and extension, and we hope that you will come and continue the conversation for that event. Uh, well, thank you all so much. We're right about at wrap-up time. I truly, truly appreciate the dedication of our speakers, Bob, Mike, and Sarah, and also Margaret Spears for giving a, a wonderful introduction, and mostly to our participants. Um, we wouldn't be putting together Ag Sector Council if it wasn't for you, and we were very excited to have such uh, a large participation today and some really great comments and resources shared in the chat box. As a reminder, we recorded the presentation today. We'll get it on AgriLinks uh, as soon as we can, hopefully by the end of the week. And we'll send an email to everyone who participated in this webinar uh, with all of the resources that we're able to pull out of this event. So thank you all so very much for attending today. And uh, we will be in touch soon. So thank you very much. And that concludes today's webinar. <laughs>